morning, good afternoon, and good evening based on where you're joining from. I'm Yamun Shir Sagar, and I'm part of Qatar Fintech Hub, which is based in Doha, Qatar, and I'm the EY India Fintech leader. Thank you all for joining us on a Monday. I understand it's been difficult times. We are managing home, family, work together. So these are difficult times. But actually, the, these are the times when humanity has made huge leaps because these are the times where people are open to accepting change. And these are the times when we, unencumbered by traditional way of thinking, start innovating and take monumental shifts or leaps as far as humanity is concerned. Now, this is the thought driven by which we, as the members of the global fintech community, decided to come together and hold a discourse on how can we build global bridges that connects us to each other and helps us work together towards building that world, towards building that change. Now, that's what we are going to do today. But in addition to that, post that, we'll briefly talk about one such initiative. We at Qatar Fintech Hub, with our global partners whom you will meet in today's session, have started a Qatar Fintech Incubation and Accelerator Program, which is our step towards building a better working world. There are some ground rules. So what we have done is, other than the speakers, we'll put everyone else on mute so you can enjoy the session and learn from it. And once, and we have also reserved some time at the end of the session for Q&A. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can see a section called Q&A. You can type your questions there and we will be taking the questions at the end of it. Now, because of time constraints, if we are not able to answer the questions in the session, what we are going to do is we are going to answer them offline. So when you're putting the question there, please put your email ID and name there. That will help us reply to you. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'll invite my friend, uh, and our EY, and EY UK FinTech leader, Thomas, to take over from me and conduct a panel discussion, which is on building global bridges for the future of FinTech. Over to you, Tom. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hemant. Well, hello, hello everyone, and, and welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, as Hemant said, my name's Tom Bull, and I'm the FinTech sector lead in the UK for EY. We've got an absolutely tremendous panel lined up today, uh, and quite a short slot to hear their views. Uh, so actually, I'm going to whiz through some quick introductions, and then we'll head straight into the questions just to leave, leave a bit more time. First up, we have Janine Hurt. Janine's the COO of Innovate Finance, the industry body for UK fintechs and, and financial innovation, where she looks after really the whole ecosystem of fintech and institutional members. Next, we have uh, Pratik Gandhi. Uh, Pratik is the Chief Operating Officer of Neom, which is a Singapore-based uh, digital payments and card issuing company. Uh, Pratik has, is a chartered accountant and a company secretary, and as well, he's got 25 years of experience in entities such as uh, Standard Chartered, Citibank, Fullerton, and PepsiCo, with experiences as diverse as running finance, ops, legal, as well as corporate and retail. Uh, we have Chia Lokhai um, from uh, Singapore FinTech Association and also the co-chair of the Blockchain Association Singapore. Uh, he has uh, close to two decades of experience um, in the financial and technology industries. Next up, we have um, Robert Croce. Robert, uh, Roberto is the managing director for Microsoft, where he's uh, focused on helping startups create and achieve their tech goals in the Middle East. Uh, Roberto joined Microsoft and the startups team with a wide range of prior experience as well, having worked for Google as the regional head um, of the emerging markets. And last, but by no means least, we've got uh, Douglas Arna. Douglas is the Kerry Holdings Professor of Law at the University of Hong Kong, uh, an expert on financial regulation, particularly the intersections of law, finance, and technology. So let me move to the first question. Uh, today, we, we're clearly in such a, an unprecedented situation owing to the impact of COVID-19. And, and this is a question I'm going to direct to two of the, frankly, the leading uh, global fintech hubs in the world. So, you know, Janine with Innovate Finance and and to the Singapore FinTech Association. Um, so Janine and Chia, given everything um, you, you've been experiencing in your respective geographies, I wonder if you could give us a sense of the, the impact and of the reaction uh, of FinTechs and the ecosystem to the, uh, to the global pandemic. And, and if we could start with Janine, please. Sure. 
Thanks, Tom. So I think really like any sector, uh, COVID-19 and the coronavirus has posed some significant challenges to fintech in the UK. But at the same time, it's a sector that's very uniquely positioned to not only help us as a wider society actually navigate through this crisis, um, but also provide some of the solutions to, to really help us to do so. So ultimately, um, COVID-19 has really underlined the importance of technology, of digital, uh, of mobile, in how we, we cater with our financial services. And so a number of fintechs have really stepped up to the plate and are providing solutions. So whether that is around helping individuals or SMEs access credit, access loans, um, or access new types of banking and financial services products. Um, what I would say is, of course, there are a number of institutions that have recognized this real need to innovate quite quickly. So if you're a fintech that is catering specifically in the reg tech space or in the B2B space and providing some of those solutions because by the nature of being a fintech you tend to be more flexible agile uh, and able to pivot you potentially may find yourself in a very very strong position at this point in time we have heard stories of reg techs in particular that have really moved from a nine-month sales cycle down to about a two or three week sales cycle with large institutions the other piece i would add is of course as always it's quite a mixed picture so we released this morning um excuse me some investment data around investment in fintech. So we saw in the first half of 2020 more than $1.8 billion invested into the UK fintech ecosystem. That's actually around a 39% decrease in the same time last year, so half one of 2019, which is potentially to be expected. However, at the same time, it's a 22% increase on H2 of 2019. So again, a relatively mixed picture. It's down from the same time last year last year, but actually increased from the second half. Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities as we look to fintech to really enable us to innovate, to transform financial services and make sure that we're relying on technology as we go forward. Okay, uh, Singapore is uh, more affected due to our unique profile. Uh, first of all, we are the largest uh, fintech hub in Southeast Asia. More than 45% of the fintech companies in Southeast Asia are based in Singapore. And second point is that uh, most of our fintech, um, uh, most of the fintechs in Singapore, 80% of them are in B2B, 80% of them uh, operate beyond Singapore. So with the lockdowns, with the restrictions in uh, traveling, uh, uh, they are affected in multiple ways. For example, uh, for example uh, projects are delayed. Uh, or even cancelled altogether. Uh, investors, while while still have the investment mandate, they are, they are very cautious now. And then, of course, without the ability to travel, you can't do sales or business development. And the key areas that are affected are mostly in these three areas, business costs, sales, and funding. And the most affected uh, sub-sectors are those in the lending and the robo-advisors. Lending because of like, uh, while on one hand, actually the need the need for credit is higher than ever, but uh, the bad debt is also higher correspondingly. The other thing about robo advisor is that during this uh, period, right, there is we observe a trend towards like a flight to, to safety. So uh, uh, the consumers are in general prefer to, to invest in, in banks. Uh, in terms of response, I think uh, in Singapore, the whole ecosystem actually came together uh, and there's a very strong element of uh, public and private uh, sectors coming together to help the, 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 the ecosystem, other than the national budget whereby there are some sort of like uh, job support in terms of uh, salary support. Uh, the regulator here, the Monetary Authority of Singapore came up with a COVID-19 package that provide uh, subsidies in terms of like, for example, if you if you, I mean, in, 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 on average, right, a fintech company spends about 60000 a year on, on cloud computing. 80% of that can be claimed. And there's also training allowance. The other thing is that some of the bigger private sector players that are relatively less affected, like uh, Razor, like AMTD Group, they provided up to $100 million of funding to provide bridging loan, to provide equity financing, or even to, uh, uh, some sort of... Uh, convertible loans yeah and then for the association we came up with a, a fintech service provider compliance readiness framework because 80% uh, of them work with uh, financial institutions so we actually standardize the minimum requirement in terms of uh, regulation on uh, outsourcing on cyber hygiene 
on technology risk to make uh, our members uh, more effective in uh, working with uh, financial institutions. And also, uh, MES, uh, SFA and AMTD came up with a grant, a 6 million grant to provide business sustenance and growth. And it's not all bad news because like uh, the Boston Consulting Group reported that actually in 2020, first half, the investments actually increased by 19%. And, this, and it observed a very strong recovery in the months of April and May, while the first queue is flat. And there are also multiple reports that uh, there is a accelerated adoption of digital finance by both consumers and businesses. Yeah, over to you. Thanks. I think Thomas, you're on mute. Sorry, that's uh, embarrassing. <laughs> Lots of interesting insights there, and, and, and I think really interesting to hear the, the government piece come through, and, and perhaps we'll come back to that later. Um, we'd love to move to the next question and, and to Pratik, um, particularly uh, a question I think many of the, the startup viewers are, are interested in, really getting into the, the topic of what kind of organizational level changes. Uh, can, can, can be brought about and have, have you seen a developer um, Neum to, to really develop and thrive in the new normal? Um, I wonder if you could talk through some of those, those kind of key learnings and, and, and how you've been deploying those. Okay, so, so before, uh, <clears throat> before I answer this, I think it's important to understand how we entered the new year. Uh, so in terms of businesses, we, we entered the year as largely a cross-border payments company. So so we were, you know, largely looking at two particular segments. One is individuals, you know, people who send funds back to their home countries uh, and for banks and e-commerce companies who basically, uh, you know, send cross-border payments on behalf of their clients. But very critically, we were to launch a new cards initiative. Uh, so we were to launch, uh, uh, so basically some uh, visa prepaid cards to individuals for travel. Uh, or to companies for managing their business uh, expenses, et cetera. So when the pandemic came upon us, the core business was doing pretty well. So the cross-border payments was doing pretty well. Uh, in, fa in fact, at all, uh, it in fact sort of uh, became a little better uh, because of various reasons. Uh, uh, but the new cards launch ran into issues uh, because of a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there was reliance on travel. And you know, travel, as we know, sort of became a bad word during this time. And we had to acquire corporate clients, which normally require a lot of face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So I agree with what Hockley was also trying to say. Uh, so closing off deals sort of became a lot more difficult for us. Also important to know that we had been expecting to close a fairly important funding round this year. Uh, <clears throat> with Visa coming in as a shareholder. So timing of the pandemic was, was pretty tough for us. So in terms of what action we took, uh, I think we pretty much took you know, similar actions to what a lot of, lot of others also must have taken. Uh, so for one thing, I think uh, uh, you know, we knew that uh, whatever the extraneous circumstances, you basically have to look internally because uh, you know, there's nothing much you can do, you know, as far as the external circumstances are concerned. So we looked at uh, essentially three things. One, we said, let's figure out how we can increase our revenues. So, uh, you know, that's kind of a, you know, a difficult thing to do. But, uh, you know, we said, let's, let's challenge ourselves and do it. Second, we said, let's reduce the unnecessary expenses. Uh, and three, let's build efficiency. So these are the three kind of core things that we said we should do. So let me talk about, you know, a little bit about all three of these three things that we did. On one, as far as the revenues were concerned, we looked at, you know, client, corridor, profitability. You know, we raised prices where we could. Uh, and that was actually super important because clearly, you know, we found that we were leaving something on the table. And you know what? The... You know, superb thing was that we did not lose a single client because we had increased our rates, right? So, so that should kind of tell you, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, such kind of issues when they come out, you know, they force, uh, you know, us to look at ourselves internally. On costs, we reviewed all the third-party costs. We looked at bank costs, rental costs, and even did some payroll rationalization. Uh, 
And as far as, you know, uh, putting in a lot of uh, automation is concerned, we sort of uh, went back to the basics, uh, looked at all the processes, you know, put a lot of development time on trying to see how most of the, you know, effort that we have is sort of straight through processing rather than having any manual intervention. And there's a lot of effort that, you know, sort of went into it. So on all of these three, three fronts, we actually did superbly well. So, uh, I mean, I can, I can basically talk uh, for hours on this topic, but, you know, if I had to say this in a few words, hmm. I just say that, you know, my great learning in the last few years was that, you know, we don't realize this, but over a period of time, a lot of waste ends up getting collected in organizations. And it's always good to clean up the house every once in a while. So I think this is like the key learning as far as, as far as Niam was concerned. Wonderful. Now, the Thank second you. aspect of it, which is, you know, the, uh, you know, what is it for the future? Uh, I think all things uh, that we have done are basically for the long term. So, you know, whether we have started focusing on increasing revenues or making sure that we don't leave anything on the table or, you know, ensuring no wasteful expenditure, automation, these are all things which will sort of uh, stand us in good stead. So it's, that's the kind of, you know, broad learnings that, you know, we should okay. sort of think of taking forward that's that's really helpful and a really helpful structure as well to think think through those those responses yeah. um roberto would would love to turn to you next if i may um and really hear the, the view from microsoft on on some of the the initiatives that you as a you know technology player have been uh, working on to to really support startups help them survive make best use of opportunities you know during this time of crisis in particular yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. Look, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the current situation, the pandemic and the COVID, uh, you know, uh, accelerated a little bit uh, something that would have happened on a longer period of time when it comes to digitization or embracing more uh, of the technologies that are available out there. Um, and specifically for um, fintech, uh, uh, we, what we notice is that there are different trends um, that, that are being accelerated. Uh, 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 one is definitely around customer experience. One is uh, around building uh, faster uh, digital capabilities. And the third one is also very interesting, especially for fintechs, is this whole thing and notion of the APIs and then building infrastructure uh, around uh, fintech and financial institutions to cooperate together. So I think that in a matter of only a few weeks, uh, you know, the world of banking has experienced a level of disruption uh, that will change everything that has been the norm in financial services. So the impact of COVID, you know, can be felt in every facet of banking from branch ATM operations, uh, someone before mentioned safety, but also to liquidity, capital management, transactions as well, cash exchanges. So though there are several considerations across the banking value chain. None of these uh, will drive impact and value if uh, they do not keep the customer at the center. So in normal times, uh, customer experience has all been about uh, making customers happy, whether the result of that could be more loyal customers, use products more, uh, less cost uh, uh, to serve uh, each customer. But in the new context, what we see is that superior customer experience means more clarity and transparency with customers, support for digital tools with, with which many customers are still not really familiar, and also new products and services for customers in distress. So some best practices we, have, we are working with banks uh, with uh, in terms of structuring uh, customer experience is structuring the measurement around journeys, not just the interactions as it has been the case so far. Um, link these measurement results directly uh, to the potential impact of uh, efficiency, set goals also on how experience and efficiency move together, and then leverage also AI and new technology, for example, use predictive analytics to determine how to be successful with the vast majority of customers. So uh, one trend is also the fact that, you know, consumer are also more into uh, a smartphone, especially I'm based here in Dubai, so across the MENA region, um, you know, the, there is a very high mobile broadband penetration, increasing smartphone ownership. So to tap into this market, for example, banks are growing their digital capabilities and innovative electronic solutions such as e-payments, electronic wallet services, et cetera. The other thing is personal finance. Um, in this region, for example, is often focused on serving customers through aggregators when looking into insurance or banking services. So as consumers improve their financial acumen and demonstrate more willingness to take ownership of their financial planning, there are more sophisticated fintechs 
that have started to emerge. I think about Sarwa, for example, in this region, someone before mentioned robot advisory. So this is great. And finally, APIs. So uh, APIs uh, uh, can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the underlying infrastructure that can disrupt banking and payments, um, and and uh, we see a lot of development and a lot of cool ideas in terms of banking as a service, whether it's unregulated startups or uh, you know uh, digital first banks uh, that that are embracing APIs to to build infrastructure API marketplaces between customers and multiple banks. So th these are ideas that are likely to succeed in the future. Fantastic, thank you. Re really interesting stuff and interesting to hear that kind of engineering approach uh, being brought to help help solve those those, those challenges for, for startups. Um, we'd love to get a, a kind of more academic perspective, you know, if we, if we may from you, Douglas. Um, clearly, we've, we've you know, heard, heard a lot recently, I guess, around precedents of, of major financial crises, the Great Depression, you know, the Asian financial crisis, a lot of reflection on, on, on the last financial crisis, uh, resulting in, in the contraction of economies and the um, and, and the kind of unique road to recovery each time. I wonder if I could, I could ask you, you know, from, from your perspective, really, what, what do you think this time around, recognizing the unique circumstances, what do you think our road to recovery is, is most likely to look like this time? Thanks a lot, Tom, and uh, great to, to be with everyone here today. You know, I think this is a, a topic that there's a lot of discussion on, particularly comparing this crisis to 2008. And I think the big starting point is to realize that this crisis is not first and foremost a financial crisis. 1997, 2008, these were primarily financial crises. This is primarily uh, a health, a humanitarian crisis. And in the first instance, the objective is really to make sure that it doesn't become a financial crisis. Because after all, if you add on a financial crisis on top of a health crisis, which is rapidly becoming an economic crisis, that really makes it worse. So our starting point has been largely making sure that the financial infrastructure works. And I think this is something that has been really good news, actually. We haven't had a major exchange fail. We haven't had any major payment systems fail. Uh, as Roberto, Roberto was saying, digitization seems to be functioning quite well. So what we're seeing instead is the financial sector is very much a focus in terms of what can the financial sector do to help us in this crisis? And I think that's a big difference between a particular 2008, where the financial sector was at the heart of the problem. This time we're seeing finance and in particular digital finance as very significant in the context of the solution. First stage has been very much a sort of liquidity crisis. The hope that this crisis is just a short, sharp shock and everything gets back to normal as soon as possible. We call that the 1919 scenario. But I think the problem is we're increasingly realizing that's not gonna happen. Um, we may be a year or more out from a vaccine. The longer this carries on, the more it turns from a liquidity crisis into a solvency crisis. And therefore, from the standpoint of how we look at this, we look at this as, are we at risk of a 1929 situation where we are looking at major structural changes? And I think that's something that we're seeing everyone around the world starting to look at as those liquidity packages start to run out. And so, if we think forward, if we think about the big impact, certainly one of the biggest issues in any economic crisis is its impact on the poorest, on inequality, on emerging markets. And we're already seeing that happening. And a big question is how can we use the resources that we have to make things better coming out? And certainly as Roberto highlighted, one of the big trends that we've seen has been a massive acceleration of digitization, particularly in finance. And so we're seeing more and more governments trying to think about how can we take this forward? How can we build better payment systems? How can we build better onboarding systems? How can we use digital finance to try to get a better result, not only out of this crisis, but going forward? And I think going forward, one of the biggest challenges for societies everywhere is going to be actually coming out of the digitization process. How are we going to deal with concentrations of data? So I think in many ways, from the standpoint of the resolution, we're dependent at this stage on the vaccine development. 
And that's something that it looks like is going to take a while. And the real question is, what is the impact in terms of industries, businesses, et cetera? And how can we try to sort out the industries, the businesses that will have a future after the crisis versus those where structural change means that the way that we did things before isn't coming back? Awesome, thank you, Douglas. R Roberto, I'd, I'd love just to um, to go back to you, if, if I may, and, and get a sense, really honing in on, on the MENA region in particular, and, and your experiences working with, with startups across MENA. Um, you, would you just give us a flavour for the level of activity and uh, and, and and kind of um, and, and a flavour of that activity, um, you know, and and, ha and how that is is shaping up in response. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, the MENA region is, is quite interesting, in my opinion, when it comes to um, uh, fintech specifically, um, because uh, what we are seeing is uh, there is a wealth of uh, ideas and entrepreneurs that are willing to take the, uh, the risk of, uh, you know, uh, developing something, something new and, and, and then, uh, you know, going, go, going after traditional uh, business models that, uh, you know, they're direct trying to disrupt very, very quickly. Um, so as I said before, uh, in MENA, uh, one specific thing is that the population is very ultra connected. So, you know, um, you, you almost receive everything here on your smartphone uh, via SMS or, or everything. There is high mobile broadband penetration rates, uh, increasing uh, um, smartphone ownership. So, uh, uh, you know, as we said before, uh, banks are growing their digital capabilities here, but there are also uh, a, a new wave of fintechs here that are, uh, you know, disrupting the market. Uh, you know, I have, for example, some former colleagues from Google, they set up this, this startup, Mamopay, uh, was established uh, uh, basically before the, before the pandemic started, is, is a mobile and web app that enables individuals, groups, communities to transfer, collect and sell through mindful micropayments. So uh, what, what Mamopay uh, proposes to do is to change the paradigm of sending requesting and splitting money uh, between friends and family. So they have this vision uh, is, is uh, to bring financial independence to every human so that they may have the time and means to live their fullest lives, right? So this is this is one, one example. Um, another example we, we mentioned before is Sarwa, for example. Uh, this is more on the, uh, it's, it's a, Sarwa is an online financial advisor aiming to make investing easy and affordable through a combination of AI. Uh, so it's, that's why the robot advisor and financial advisors so assist through how the investment process. Uh, so uh, uh, as, as startups are evolving into the region, the other, the other big connection that's here uh, is relevant is being the region more uh, government-led. Uh, you know, there are, uh, uh, you know, some uh, incubators, accelerators, but also regulators that are, uh, you know, joining, uh, you know, initiatives together to make sure that startups find the right platform uh, at hand to, to basically develop uh, a solution or plug into a platform where they can, they, where they can basically uh, develop at scale. So think about uh, uh, this concept of the sandbox or digital labs, where basically uh, startups can be experimenting new business models without, uh, you know, any regulatory restriction on on uh, on a technology like could be Azure Sandbox, uh, uh, built for either a central bank or the regulator in in a country, where basically startups can plug into an environment where they are directly plug it into the cloud, they can find the bank in a day environment where they can easily test their POC or, you know, their solution. Uh, and then they can, they can uh, scale the development of technology faster, which is uh, one of the key uh, areas where, uh, uh, you know, startups that have a strong proposition, they're really keen, uh, keen on, right? So we see that there is a lot of development in this region when it comes to fintech. Uh, local uh, central banks and governments are keen to uh, make it easy for fintechs that want to develop in this region to tap into sort of digital labs or sandbox where they can scale and then connect this uh, in a meaningful way with financial institutions. So um, as a technology provider, we are eager to support uh, this development because we can help reach more scale and impact across uh, you know, the population uh, uh, in, in, a, in a faster way and in also in a reliable way when it comes to all the regulations, when it comes to data location or privacy and security. So one thing that probably might evolve in some countries in this region is also the, uh, the cloud policies. Uh, not all of the regions have lo local data centers, but still we see that there is an acceleration in that sense. Awesome, thank you. And, and, and Douglas, the, um, just reflecting on that, I, I guess the um, I mean, talent feels like a, an absolutely critical component of, of, of kind of development and ecosystem building and, and bringing in the right skills to support businesses. I, I wonder if you could comment on, on, on that angle particularly and, and also the, 
um, just just your overall message really in terms of the um, you know, how you see the path to recovery and what your message would be to to aspiring fintech businesses in, in in light of that difficult period. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I think the key here really is when we're looking at. Um, what you need to do in terms of thinking about building going forward. The first is really from the standpoint of investment in human capital. Basically to build a FinTech ecosystem, you need both fin talent as well as tech talent. And the most competitive jurisdictions that we're seeing are those who have both of those. And that is a long-term educational commitment to build both sides. The second aspect that we're really seeing is um, the use of spending some money on core infrastructure, and in particular, sovereign digital identity systems, interoperable payment systems networks. And I think building all of these things together, if one is looking at not only bringing in foreign fintechs, but developing your own talent ecosystem, core to that is R&D spending. And that money needs to go both from the standpoint of uh, traditional research and development in universities, as well as more on the corporate side, the startup side, supporting viable ideas. And that is where you get uh, essentially your overall ecosystem. So from the standpoint of anyone looking to move forward, you need to understand what is going on in the tech space. You don't necessarily need to be an expert on each piece of technology, but you need to understand it in order to be able to figure out how it relates to how not only you might be able to do your own business better, but the risks it might raise. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Janine, I'd, I'd love to turn, turn back to you to get, get some more perspectives from, from the UK side of things, particularly on those kind of ecosystem building efforts. You know, the role of incubators, accelerators, uh, really supporting the growth of the ecosystem. Um, and also more, more widely, you know, how important you see government support in being supporting the industry. I wonder if you could comment on, on those themes, please. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, Tom, the first thing I would say is ultimately it is very much about partnerships and an entire ecosystem uh, working together to make sure that fintech and financial innovation thrives. I think accelerators, incubators are absolutely integral to the development of uh, financial technology and innovation as well. Uh, and I think in particular, the government's role and the regulators as well is absolutely crucial. So one of the reasons we feel that the UK sits very much at the forefront of financial innovation is down to the fact we have such a support of government and such a support of government in the form of HMT and also an extremely supportive and proactive regulator in the form of the FCA and also the Bank of England. So I think looking even in the face of COVID-19 at some of the initiatives that government has launched to try and help SMEs uh, and particularly in the fintech space, it's been a phenomenal time. I mean, looking at something we have called the Future Fund, which is enabling startups that are potentially having difficulty in raising money, the government will match a certain amount that they are are been, they've been given by VC, so that's a real platform to help startups as they grow and as they scale. Uh, there is potentially a gap in the growth capital space, but we are working closely uh, with partners across the ecosystem to try and fill that uh, in addition. As another reflection of the appetite of the UK governments, they've just announced, relaunched, I should say, a UK FinTech strategic review. So looking at how we can ensure that we remain competitive on the financial innovation landscape and what types of components and what areas we need to work on to move that forward. So looking at areas like capital and investment, talent and skills, national FinTech and international FinTech, and then also bringing in partnerships uh, between startups and incumbents and financial inclusion and financial wellness as well. The last Last piece I would say is really around the regulators. So we've all we, we've mentioned it a few times in here in terms of uh, the sandboxes, and we know of course that the FCA several years ago launched the first uh, sandbox uh, in in terms of in within the UK. But they've also just announced a digital sandbox in light of COVID. So bringing in startups, bringing in scale ups that potentially have solutions to try and help society move forward, particularly during this time of crisis. So absolutely. Uh, Building an ecosystem really play, keeps all players. Um, you need to have government support, you need to have regulator support, institutional support, fintech, startups, scale ups, and also investors, of course, as well. So it is very much an ecosystem uh, pushed together. Fantastic. I'd, I'd love to thank you, Janine. I'd love to get the, the view from Singapore as well. Uh, Chia Hotlai, uh, from the how, how you see the major trends shaping up in probably the next few years, but also a comment, if you would, on the kind of um, Islamic finance sector and, and, and how you see the role of that in the um, in the Singapore ecosystem. Oh, and, and you're on mute. Sorry, the same mistake I made earlier. 
Okay, great. Uh, we are seeing a few trends uh, from the fintechs and the tech fins. Uh, we are seeing uh, rebundling. Uh, many of them started off as a single product uh, uh, startups, but as they acquire more customers, uh, it makes more sense for them to start uh, branching into related services. So we have uh, payment companies uh, starting to offer credit services, and then after that, offer insurance or even uh, investment services. Uh, point to I think uh, Neom also went into the, the uh, corporate card uh, service. And in, in Singapore, we see the Grab. Grab uh, starting as a right hearing. Uh, they went into uh, payments and then they acquired uh, companies in the credit space. And also they also recently also acquired a company in the uh, robo advisory space. So that is the rebunding from the, the, the FinTech and the tech fin space. And for as for the traditional banks, uh, we see some of them um, trying out uh, to be a platform play. So uh, in Singapore, uh, both two of the local banks they operate they are operating uh, property and uh, car porters because these are this in a way can uh, provide uh, leads for their uh, loan services. Uh, and this is very much the the the, the playbook of uh, China fintech. And then the other thing we are seeing, uh, especially in the space of uh, digital bank, uh, which uh, for the last 12 months uh, took, a, took up a lot of uh, attention uh, in, in the region, uh, whereby uh, Hong Kong last year issued uh, a uh, virtual banking license. Uh, Singapore going to issue five digital banking licenses this year. And some of the banks uh, decided they, they wanted to be the bank behind the digital bank. Yeah, so, uh, so that's one strategy, we, one one direction we are looking at. The other trend that uh, we are observing is that the big tech or the tech fin, uh, especially those from China, they are moving uh, into tech providers rather than financial services. I think one, one reason is because uh, regulators are also getting smarter now on how to regulate these uh, uh, big tech firms. So they find that uh, probably it's better for them to provide their their yeah, technological expertise and solutions to the banks rather than and to the fintech companies rather than uh, competing with them directly. I think today uh, or yesterday, uh, and financials uh, they they just launched their end change solution, which is a blockchain solution for 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 uh, companies. Uh, the other thing we are seeing is that finally blockchain uh, uh, a lot of uh, blockchain use cases moving out from experimentation moving into commercialization. I think uh, two weeks back, uh, MES, uh, they just concluded phase five of, phase five of uh, Project Wubit uh, and concluded that uh, wholesale CBDC is uh, very viable. And uh, we see uh, those like related to trade finance, like uh, Contour, like uh, WeTrade, uh, they are doing quite well there. And the other trend we are seeing is that for a lot of the fintechs, it's about path to profitability instead of growth at all costs. So I think a lot will have to focus more on, on how to how how to streamline their, their portfolio and be profitable and in, instead of uh, moving into too many directions. And then of course, with COVID-19, all the above are all accelerated. <laughs> with regards to Islamic finance, uh, I'm, to be frank, uh, I have limited knowledge about that. But uh, I think uh, this is, uh, I mean, Southeast Asia is a very attractive place for Islamic finance especially in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. For example, in Indonesia, there are about 230 million Muslims. Most of them are unbanked, about 50 to 70% of them unbanked, but most of them has smartphones. So it, it, it provides that opportunity for, for Islamic fintech company to come into that, that, this space. And most of the most of the uh, uh, space they, they went, the vertical they went to are mostly in, in terms of uh, crowdfunding and microcredit. I think the key challenge for Islamic uh, finance is education and awareness. I think a lot of uh, Muslim might not be aware that their financial affairs mm -hmm. should also comply to uh, uh, Islamic principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Herman, we're, we're almost we're up against time, but I just wanted to finish with a question for, to uh, Pratik, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, sure, please go ahead. Uh, super. So Pratik, really, really, I think a pertinent one to um, those uh, kind of local MENA entrepreneurs, uh, given your um, activities in the region um, and, and, and uh, really the, um, the partnership opportunities and benefits to local startups from, from working with Neom as part of your 
uh, your activity within the region. I wonder if you if you could help us um, finish the panel with you know your message to that local community of entrepreneurs around those opportunities and uh, and benefits. Yeah, sure. So uh, so for one thing, we are looking for a partner. <laughs> so that clearly is one opportunity. Second, uh, SMEs are generally uh, you know under penetrated and very very uh, ignored, I'd say, by the bigger banks. So. You know, our role is really that of a disruptor, uh, essentially. And uh, wherever we go, we are able to reduce the cost of operations for, you know, these local users by a massive percentage. Uh, you know, we've launched in Australia. We cut the cost of sending funds by around 30%. Uh, in Malaysia, when we launched, we cut it by a third. So for one, the customers can look forward to, you know, a, a cost-efficient service provider who knows how to deal with SMEs. You know, a large percentage of our customers actually happens to be SMEs, so we know how to deal with them. Yeah, that's it. Super. Thank you very much. Really helpful. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Hemant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, panelists. Uh, that was an amazing discussion. But first of all, one key thing I took out was I started with a hypothesis that this is a time which is a time to accelerate how fast humanity moves and bring the future forward. It seems it is good to get that concept validated with such an esteemed panel. In addition to that, I see there are three key, key, key um, themes that have emerged based on what Hawkeye said, what Douglas said, what Janine said. One part of it is a lot of stimulus has come from government in both in terms of keeping up the demand and also in terms of supporting the fintechs in, in some way. But, but on the other side, as we Robert Ophaile pointed out, that it is also an opportunity where we are quickly increasing our productivity, which for a long time had become really stable, right? This is the time we are pushing up productivity, which, which might change, change things. In addition to that, as Pratik specifically pointed out, there was some amount of money which was maybe on the table and companies have realized, and as Hawk pointed out, to actually look and focus on profitability uh, which in some way was going towards growth and, and that had become the dominant aspect. That was fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, our panelist. Next on, we have Hank. Hank is a Managing Director of Financial Sector at Qatar Financial Center. What Hank is going to do is he's going to provide us a peek into the fintech development and investment opportunities which Qatar is creating in the region. Hank, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Hemant, uh, for the for the introduction. Um, great panel discussion, by the way. Uh, it shows clearly that fintech is all about teamwork and partnership. And I'm going to make here a pitch for Qatar. Um, Qatar is a small but very ambitious country, and I would say I would define it as the getting things done country. Um, fintech companies that are interested in Mina, and and the panel has clearly shown that it, it, it's a very interesting area you know, should select a home. And I think what other country can you better select than a ambitious and also very rich country with very good connectivity? Um, and um, th this is what we are trying to pitch to fintech companies. Uh, fintech companies will always come when there is business uh, opportunities to them, not just to find out a place to work and live, but, but to see whether there's actual business. And Qatar Financial Center is a, uh, which I represent, uh, is a government platform, which uh, gives licenses or commercial registrations, if you wish, to operate in the country. The good thing about uh, having a financial center is that it's under UK common law-like uh, jurisdiction. So it gives the safety of, of, of a, a, a legal system that you know, and all the, uh, let's say, professional standards that you expect from a financial center. The interesting thing is that you know we are not only uh, offshore, we are onshore. So if you're on our platform, you can do business in the country. And I think that is unique also in the Middle East. Um, so what we are doing, um, and that's good that we show slide number two, is um, we offer the opportunity for fintech companies to come and register. Um, and then we will make sure that there is market access and if you are interested also investor access because it's a small country you know we quickly can get access to those um, and we work together with all the uh, all the parties in qatar i think it's unique that the regulators qatar development bank and all the banks are working together it is fair to say i think in general for mina that the um, that the banks are a bit behind and they like to work in a partnership model uh, and i like the comment from singapore 
we see more and more technology service providers. So FinTech are not necessarily the disruptors. These are the, the partners in technology. And we have created at QFC a, an opportunity because we think that 80% of the FinTech is non-regulated. You don't need to, to have a sandbox license to just provide technology to a bank. So for those parties that are interested in that type of FinTech, we can give you a license within, uh, within two weeks. And here on this slide, you see the categories uh, that we can uh, service. I think most important is if you're interested in this market, reach out to me and my team. We're all ex-bankers and ex-regulators. We're commercial people like you guys, and we would like to really help you. Uh, and if the domains, I think George will talk about the domains and, and what are the most pressing needs. But a country like Qatar with a great event coming up, the, the, the World Championships, is a great place to do business, not only in the country, but from Qatar into other uh, nearby markets. Uh, and uh, that's basically what I would like to uh, show to you guys. Uh, the UK, uh, Innovate Finance, but also the Investment Association, uh, we see a lot of fintech companies coming from that area. And then Asia comes next, Singapore, um, uh, and, and also some Chinese. <laughs> And I will conclude with the fact that we have some Europeans. But in other words, I only have five minutes. <laughs> is uh, I hope if you're interested and see this, please pick up the phone or email or LinkedIn and approach us, and, and we will help you in this market. Back to Hemant. Thanks, Hank. It's always a pleasure hearing you. And it's beautiful that on a single uh, webinar, we have Innovate Finance, we have uh, Qatar FinTech Hub, and we also have Singapore FinTech Association. We're kind of covering the the uh, the world in terms of the ecosystem. But with that, what we have is we also have Peter Clark, Chief, Chief Operating Officer from Doha Bank with us. Uh, Peter has 33 years of experience across banking and fintech across UK, Denmark, Japan, Hong Kong, India, Qatar. And uh, with that experience, what, I, what we would like to know from Peter is in his opinion, what is the role that Qatar and Qatari financial institutions and considering the physical location as Hank pointed out and the uh, financial position that Qatar has can enable can do to enable the fintech ecosystem as a whole and creating global opportunities for global fintech. Peter, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, as, as a banker, I view fintechs and banks will need each other to succeed. So it's a win-win. Uh, fintechs bring talent, ideas, capability, and connectivity. New ways of doing things and learning from other markets. Uh, but banks bring capital, customers, distribution, balance sheet, expertise, branding and trust, and banking licenses. I think if you combine the two, you have something much greater than the sum of the parts. And I, I, th I think when fintechs and banks work together, uh, each playing to their own strengths, then, then I, I, I definitely think uh, those organizations can, can really thrive. Um, I just want, do you want to say something about COVID? Um, Obviously, it's been impacting the banks a lot. I mean, for COOs, you know, we want to be driving digital innovation and a lot of customer centricity. But for the past few months, we've been working on things like, you know, home working, separating our staff. Um, people can't travel. We can't get vendors on site. Most staff are working from home. So we've kind of been in um, kind of crisis or, or crisis management for the past few months. But I do feel at least in Qatar, things are easing a lot and we're, we're through to the next phase of that. But I do think it'll have a very profound impact on, on banking globally, uh, banks in Qatar and, and us, for, for two reasons. The first one, I think, is an economic one. Obviously, COVID the, you know, COVID's going to have quite a dramatic economic impact and, and banks are heavily... Uh, affected by the prevailing economic climate. Um, interest rates will be low. Um, I assume bankruptcies will be going up and that's all gonna pressure banks and banks are gonna need to be more efficient. And the second thing is around digital shift. Um, I, I can imagine that a lot of these trends are already happening anyway, cashless society, uh, moving away from physical instruments. But I, I think this will only be accelerated. Uh, and we're already seeing that now, you know, you, you go to some countries, they'll, they'll refuse to take cash now. And I could, I could certainly see in a couple of years time, you know, cash being, being gradually eased out. And, and it's certainly something personally I, I, I would welcome. 
I think with technology now, it's, and, you know, even you go to countries like China, where, you know, I've, I've been traveling a lot the last few years, haven't used cash at all. I can imagine checks will go. Uh, I don't think customers are going to want to touch uh, screens or keypads, so I think all payments will be contactless, um, either through mobile wallet, tap and go, or through some kind of facial recognition. Um, I, th I think branch visits will be a lot lower. So, so you know, we in Doha Bank, and I'm, I'm sure every bank, you know, in, around the world, is looking about how can they uh, divert more of their customer traffic towards uh, towards digital. So I, I think I think it's going to be dramatic. I, I think the fallout from this, you know, is going to be, um, you know, for the next couple of years, very interesting for us to see. Um, in terms of fin, fintech ecosystems, I've, I've, you know, I've had the privilege of working in some some great countries and and witness firsthand what uh, world class ecosystems can do. And you know, I was in I was in Hong Kong, China, and Singapore for for some time. And, and I, I think it can really help the banks. I think it helps the fintechs. And I, I think it helps, helps the, the customers as well through, through improved choice. So, um, you know, things like, like mentorships and hackathons and, and training and education, speed dating, sandboxes, um, cross-industry collaboration projects and, and, and insightful regulations or the regulations that encourage innovation uh, can have a big difference. But, but for me, the number one thing that you need in any ecosystem is, is, a, is a pipeline for talent. And um, that, that's something that can be domestically grown through, through universities or, or in some markets maybe uh, uh, you know, Im imported through, uh, through quite open immigration schemes. But I think for, for a, a good FICO, fintech ecosystem to, to, to flourish in a market really requires the um, uh, good access to the very best in terms of finance and technology talent. Um, so as for yeah, Peter, uh, you know, that is actually very, very interesting. And uh, thanks for those inputs. I think the theme clearly emerging is collaboration seems to be the core theme uh, of, of Going, getting through this difficult time and innovating and going together. But what now I would like to do is, of all the discussion that we have done, uh, what I would do, like to do is invite Jodis, to, you know, who is a core member and FinTech advisor to Qatar FinTech Hub and a business intelligence man manager at QDB, to talk about one of such manifestation of these ideas of global innovation and global ecosystem and talk about a bit about Qatar FinTech Hub and the, the work that Qatar FinTech Hub do, is doing in this direction. George is over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Himant. I appreciate it. Well, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to take part in this webinar, being the second one uh, organized and uh, hosted by Qatar Fintech Hub among a series of webinar planned for the coming uh, year. So um, on behalf of Qatar Fintech Hub and Qatar Development Bank, we're very much delighted to have our global stakeholders participating with us today, um, especially Innovate Finance from UK, Neom from Singapore, and Microsoft, our technology partner, uh, yeah. Singapore FinTech Association, Doha Bank, uh, Qatar Financial Center, and uh, Professor Douglas. So uh, the panel was, was amazing and uh, very much enjoyed uh, the discussion among the, the panelists. So uh, just for the time constraint, I'm gonna uh, talk briefly about uh, two important initiatives addressed by uh, the, the, the FinTech Hub. The, the first one is the ecosystem development in Qatar, the FinTech ecosystem development. And the second point is about the Qatar FinTech Hub uh, local and global partnership. So since we had a clear strategy uh, designed and delivered back in, in 2018, we managed in Qatar through the regulators, through the Qatar Central Bank, to establish a, a FinTech section, which is mandated to come up with the FinTech regulation. So this year we're starting with the payment regulation. We're addressing the payment regulation. Uh, and this is coming straight after 
the design and the development of a regulatory sandbox to be launched towards the end of this year uh, through the central bank in order to perform the necessary testing and respectively pro provide the necessary license, uh, licenses for the fintech institution and the fintech companies who might uh, come, come to Qatar and establish their companies in Qatar to serve a wide fintech community. So in Qatar, we have 15 plus a financial institution. Uh, so there is a good chance uh, for global fintech companies to explore uh, this uh, territory. And this is also in light with the upcoming FIFA World Cup 2022 that should take place uh, during the last quarter of 2022. And um, why we are addressing the, the fintech agenda, why we're driving it from the Qatar Development Bank perspective, is to make the Qatari uh, financial services sector globally competitive. This is one of the uh, main, main objectives. So in order to, to do so, we have uh, performed strategic alliances with many FinTech hub around the world. So we've had uh, strategic alliances with Hatch Quarter in Australia, with Innovate Finance, as I mentioned, with uh, FinTech of Sweden, uh, with the FinTech uh, Association of uh, Malaysia, with Mumbai FinTech Hub, Istanbul FinTech Hub, etc. So um, our ultimate objective out of this partnership is to identify solutions which are relevant for the market uh, in Qatar and probably ensure the technology transfer from the well-developed market and then bring them to Qatar and respectively work on localizing them in the Qatari market. And from the other side, we're very much keen to develop local FinTech companies. And through our uh, partnership with the Global FinTech Hub, we are trying or we will be trying down the road to scale up those um, local companies towards uh, export territories. And most importantly, is to promote bilateral relationship. Um, so in a very short period of time since the FinTech Hub was announced last uh, April, we were keen to, to perform a strong and strategic uh, partnership. So we were keen to, to have um, a very strong partnership with Microsoft being the technology partner. As an outcome of this partnership, the FinTech uh, incubators and accelerators who might be incubated and accelerated at Qatar FinTech uh, incubation and acceleration program could have a chance also to access Microsoft Sandbox, which is going to be hosted at Microsoft Azure Cloud Platform. Um, in addition to that, uh, we managed to perform strategic uh, relationship with the leading bank in the region, Qatar National Bank, Doha Bank. Uh, we also managed to tie up with Visa and, and MasterCard. We're exploring a partnership with, with R3. Um, I would like to thank everybody, all the participants for their interest in Qatar FinTech Hub. Um, and we look forward to work with you down the road in order to achieve the desired economic impact for our nation, which is set by Qatar National Vision 2030. Thank you again, back to you, Hamad. Thank you, George. Uh, that was insightful, and thank you for the details of the work that Qatar Fintech Hub is doing in the market. Next up, what I would like to do is I would like to invite Hilal Al Kuari, project lead for Qatar Fintech Hub and senior incubation advisor at QDV, to talk about the Qatar Fintech Incubator and Accelerator program. The application phase for the program is right now going on. So I think a lot of people have joined, have joined to really understand what the program is about, how can they apply for it. So, Hilal, over to you. Thank you, Himan. Uh, this is Hilal al -Kawari. I will talk about uh, the program that we are offering in Qatar Fintech Hub. Uh, starting with uh, the focus, uh, the focus uh, area that we have in Qatar Fintech Hub, we have uh, payment, fintech, Islamic finance, and SMEs. In Qatar Fintech Hub, uh, we aim to develop fintech industry in Qatar in accordance with the Qatar National uh, Fintech Strategy, as it's mentioned by my colleague George. 
to contribute and reiterate Qatar position as a leading international fintech hub in the region, as outlined in Qatar National Vision 2030. Uh, here we can see uh, our program incubator and accelerator. On the right side, we can see the date. The due date uh, for the application is 31st July for incubator and accelerator. For incubator, it's focus uh, for uh, it's designed for the early stage entrepreneurs fintechs with minimum viable product who want to transform their prototype to saleable product, build, tri build traction and raise fund. For the accelerator uh, program, it's designed for mature and, uh, and advanced uh, startup. Those who are looking for a global expansion with proven product market fit. Uh, also, we have Angel Investor Masterclass uh, conducted by uh, global angel investors to support capacity building of local angel community. By uh, As a part of the demo day, we will uh, uh, publish the white paper to provide an overview of fintech ecosystem in Qatar, regional global trends, and performance of fintech of Qatar. Due to the current situation, we will do the, the program virtually. Talking about the value prop proposition and what we are going to, have to offer for uh, our fintechs. We are going to offer financial, uh, financial and non-financial support, as well as uh, mentoring and the training provided by Qatar Fintech Hub mentors. As mentioned by my, uh, by my colleague uh, George about the local and international uh, uh, entities, the, our partners, our fintechs will uh, will be get opportunity to collaborate with over the, the 17 institution, financial institution, and regulatories who are part of Qatar Fintech Hub. Also, they will uh, be utilize a global network that we uh, built, which include global fintechs, universities, big tech firms, etc. Uh, also, uh, we will help them for uh, will help them, uh, help, help them. For, uh, as I mentioned, for the market access, local and international. For logistic support, we will uh, provide them uh, office space uh, and many, th uh, many, uh, and several things and get a development bank. That's uh, from my side. And I think already uh, regarding the commercial establishing for QFC, already Hank has uh, mentioned. Thank you to you, Hank Hemant. Thank you, Hilal. So um, as Hilal pointed out, it is a fantastic program uh, if you're planning to take your FinTech Global. Uh, and the applications started on 1st of June. So if you are a procrastinator like me or you're an engineer and you have still not applied for the program, it is still open till 31st of July. So please do, please do apply. If your application is half completed, please complete those applications and apply for the program. We are nearly at the top of the hour, so I know I see there are a lot of questions which I have pointed out, but we are not going to keep those questions hanging. What we are going to do is we'll take up those questions with the experts that we have had on the panel today, and we'll get those answers sent to you offline. So in case you have any additional questions that you're not asked yet, please submit those questions. That should be fine. And thank you for joining us today on a Monday and through this difficult time. Uh, and we hope to stay together with you and work with you to use this difficult time as an opportunity, opportunity to take humanity uh, forward. On the screen, you see uh, our social media handles and details, and you also see a QR code. You can use that to reach the form where you can apply for the program. You can, use, you can just follow us on our social media handles to be updated on the different happenings and updates on the program. And in the end, uh, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today, and thank you for all our audiences for coming online, sparing an hour on a Monday, and uh, listening to our webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. How many listeners?